It's a pleasure to be here at the inaugural conference uh, on the new wave of AI in healthcare in New York City, organized by Mount Sinai and the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to uh, Dr. David Rue, uh, Global CMO of Microsoft. Um, David, uh, you, you personally and your company are building fabulous uh, systems, very large AI systems. Um, so how can you deploy them? How can you make sure that academia has also access to that new wave of AI tools that are now at our fingertips? I spend a lot of time talking with clients and partners across the country. Uh, they're super excited over some of the newer developments in artificial intelligence, specifically generative AI. And there's four things that I always recommend that they think of. So the first is uh, there are, are different ways that you can start testing and developing generative AI models. And one of those is that you can go onto the internet and you can start testing. But if, if it involves uh, very specific things towards the patient or involves perhaps even confidential information, I highly recommend, our, our group highly recommends that you use an enterprise version. And what that essentially means is that you go to uh, your own uh, Azure tenant and you can upload all the documents that you want on that are relevant for that particular use case. And then you can apply the large language models on top of those existing data sets. It allows you to be able to create a playground and a production environment so you can do all the testing before you actually go to full deployment. So that's perhaps one of the first things. Second is that there are so many great use cases. I would highly recommend that we start with the high impact, low risk use cases. These are areas where there's tremendous opportunity to make a difference in healthcare, but let's not start with the most complicated ones first. And to do that right, oftentimes it requires what I'll refer to as the human in the loop. Make sure that that human is someone who is, uh, whose life uh, is better because the AI is helping that person take care of some of the administrative or the heavy workloads. And that allows us to be able to do things in a way that's more responsible. And lastly, and we don't talk quite a, as much about this, but uh, as we start deploying it, we need to ensure that we put in governance processes. And we need to ensure that people understand that this was done uh, without bias or we've mitigated bias, that it's done transparently, and that we also look at the end result and ensure that the end result is what we expected. Uh, because in some cases, we might have to tweak or adjust based on uh, what we find from the end results. And, and those are the key things that I'll just say are starting points for organizations as they go on this journey of how they can apply AI responsibly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you build AI in, in the way you just described it, you can certainly build fabulous tools for diagnostics or for treatment decision making and so forth. But which area of healthcare do you think are going to be impacted first by uh, the new wave of technologies? Yeah, so let's think about AI as uh, this broad category of you know, sort of advanced algorithms, uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning algorithms, and then generative AI, which is a little bit different because there's a, a, a greater concern for the fact that it can get things wrong, you know, with hallucinations and things like that, but tremendous power in terms of its capabilities. And so each has its own advantage, disadvantage. Let's look at the problems, identify which tool is most appropriate, and in some cases we may combine some of these AI tool sets, and that will allow us to be able to start thinking about how we can uh, deploy this in, in an efficient and a uh, way that will lead to the best results. I would say with generative AI, it will definitely be things that allow us to be able to remove a lot of the administrative workloads from the system. There's a lot of inefficiency and waste, oftentimes placed on the busy clinicians. If you can make their lives better, easier, it'll improve healthcare outcomes. So these days, there's of course a lot of enthusiasm, so on the research side, on the side of hospitals and practitioners, uh, but the number of AI applications that actually found their way into the clinic or to the bedside or into the hands of physicians are very often very few. There are areas where you only have one or two FDA approved systems. So how can we, uh, in your uh, thinking about that space, how we can we actually accelerate that progress so these tools are, with it, all the tools we are talking about are actually available for physicians uh, and help patients and do not just stay hypothetically uh, uh, fabulous uh, instruments <laughs> that are never deployed. Well, one of the things we have seen are that there are many uh, use cases uh, for AI today but they tend to fall into a very common buckets, you know, very, you know, certain diagnostic areas. And what we're now realizing with generative AI is it can be applied to almost every 
category, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's from supply chain to actual, you know, some of the workflow issues that we face uh, to research and R and D. I mean, tremendous opportunities to start looking at generative AI to help with hypothesis generation. Uh, to be able to start looking at large data sets and be able to glean insights from those data sets that normally would have required years of training, you know, building these machine learning models. So I, I think that there's just so many great opportunities out there. We're going to start seeing uh, a, a significant influx of uh, AI that will, will want to be deployed in specific areas. And that's part of the reason why it's so important that we put in governance processes around this. Because if organizations just kind of let everyone do their own thing, we're going to have, uh, some cases, amazing results, in other cases, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we address both. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, so one area we are very focused on at Mount Sinai is equity. Mount Sinai serves an enormously diverse patient population across New York City. I do think that's a necessity to build uh, AI responsible, that you make sure it works for everyone. Uh, how do you see that taking up uh, at uh, Microsoft or uh, across your partners in the healthcare system more broadly? Uh, so maybe I'll start locally. Uh, one of the things that we recognize is uh, individuals that need services oftentimes rely on uh, the resources that are most local to them. And it may not be a hospital or health system. It could be uh, care that's delivered or advice that's delivered in a local clinic. It could be uh, even through churches and schools and barber shops where those individuals provide a lot of guidance uh, mm -hmm. for people. Uh, in, in communities in which uh, maybe the, the language isn't their first language, uh, they may rely on people elders or seniors within those communities to help guide them. And, and it's empowering those individuals and those organizations with the tools to be able to help know what is the right thing to do uh, and where can they go to seek care. That's where we have an opportunity to be able to help AI, or AI may be able to help. And you know, we've been working with organizations across the country where we're combining uh, information, or we're allowing community-based organizations to work in collaboration with local public health and healthcare and allow for bi-directional sharing of information. That's been exceptionally important to allow that communication channel, but the issue that we've run into is that the data itself is oftentimes incomplete or it's uh, something that needs mm -hmm. to be fixed. And, and about 80% of the data that comes in from FQHCs or federally qualified health centers into local public health is oftentimes unusable. Mm -hmm. So while we have the infrastructure, how do you clean the data? And that's where AI comes in. Because AI can help clean that data and can make it usable so that we can actually start acting on it. And, and that's at the, I'll say at the local level, at the global level from a health equity perspective, we now have an opportunity to democratize these AI tools and capabilities for anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you're in another country, a developing country, and you have no access to care, you now have an ability to be able to interface with tools and systems that could give you the capability to be able to have care at a level that you could never have imagined. So it's extra extraordinary right now. We have an opportunity to apply AI to close the gaps in some of these major health equity issues that we mm -hmm. face. Uh, I think that's one of the most exciting opportunities we have with AI, the democratization of access to healthcare globally. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Last question, how many parameters does GPT-4 have? <laughs> More than a thousand. <laughs>